Hi guys, welcome or welcome back to my channel. I hope you're having a good day so far. My name is Jada, I am Italian, so I apologize in advance for any mispronunciation or anything I will say wrong in this video. I think you've all heard about what is happening right now in the United States and in the world in general, with all the protests and people marching on the streets to defend black lives and their rights. To me, it's crazy. I never thought that we would still fight for people's lives and rights in 2020. Anyway, there's been a lot of violence out there, but also a lot of beautiful things have been said and a lot of amazing messages have been spread during these demonstrations. Also, many names of unjustly killed black people have been shouted out in the streets so that their names and their stories should not be forgotten. What I wanted to do today is support this cause by shouting another name, another story that I really don't want people to forget. I want this person's memory to remain eternal, along with all the other stories of inequity that people of color have endured during history. If you have seen my previous videos, I won't be integrating The Sims 4 in this video today, just because I don't think it's very respectful to have a game on screen while I talk to you about this story. This is going to be a very reflective and commemorative kind of video. I'm warning you, this story is very heavy and it's probably gonna make you very, very frustrated and very upset. This is the story of George Junior Stinney Jr. Born October 21st, 1929, died June 16th, 1944. He was a 14 year old African American boy who was convicted for the murdering of two white girls aged 7 and 11 in his hometown in Akalu, South Carolina. He was executed by electric chair on June 16th, 1944. He is considered to be the youngest American to have been sentenced to death and executed. And it was innocent. Let me take you to the beginning of this story so that you'll understand better. In 1944, George Junior Stinney Jr. was a 14-year-old boy living in Okolu, South Carolina with his father, George Stinney Sr. and his mother Amy. He also had two brothers, Charles and Johnny, and two sisters, Catherine and Amy. George Sr. worked on the town's sawmill and the family resided in company housing. Alcolo was a small working class mill town where black and white people were separated by railroad tracks. The town was typical of small southern towns of the time. They had segregated schools and churches for white and black people, so they'd have little to no contact between them. One day, on March 23rd, 1944, the bodies of Betty June Binnaker, age 11, and Mary Emma Thames, age 7, were discovered on a ditch on the African side of the town during a search after they had not returned home the night before. The girls, they had seemed to have been hit by a blunt instrument, something metallic, and to be honest, reports different on what kind of instrument was used to hit the girls. It was thought to be something metallic with a round head, sort of like a hammer. Both girls' skulls were punctured and the medical examiner also found out that there was no sign of sexual assault on the younger girl, but the genitalia of the older one seemed to be bruised. And remember this because it's going to be very important later on. Before they were found dead, the girls were last seen riding their bicycles looking for flowers and the last two people who saw them were actually George Jr. Stinney Jr. and his younger sister Amy. George reported that the girls stopped to ask him if he knew where to find Maypop, which was a local name for passion flower. And that was it. Nobody saw them alive ever again. The very next day, March 24th, 1944, the sheriff told the town that he had made an arrest and that he had arrested George Junior Stinney Jr. with the accusation of murder, saying that he had confessed his crime and said that George led the sheriff to a long piece of iron. In the beginning, actually, George was arrested with his older brother Johnny, but Johnny was immediately released while George was held. He was not able to see his family or anyone until his trial and conviction. According to a handwritten statement, the sheriff that arrested George was H.S. Newman, a Clarendon County deputy who said, I arrested a boy by the name of George Steeney. He then made a confession and told me where to find a piece of iron about 15 inches, where he said he put it in a ditch about six feet from the bicycle. But no confession statement signed by George is known to exist. As I see it, George was a very easy target because it was reported to have gotten into fights at school, including a fight where he had scratched a girl with a knife. 
These accusations made by his own 7th grade teacher were actually contested by his own sister Amy when they were brought up in 1995. But a local white woman in 2014, she actually said that she knew George when she was very young and she said she knew George because he tried to threaten her and a friend and that he was considered a bully. Following George's arrest, his father of course lost his job at the sawmill they had to move away from the company housing and they were starting to fear for their own safety. So he had no support at all during his 81 day confinement. He actually was detained in a jail 50 miles away from his hometown because there was a high risk of lynching. So George was questioned alone without his parents Although the Sixth Amendment guarantees legal counsel, it was not until 1963 with the case of Gideon v. Wainwright that explicitly required representation through the course of criminal proceedings. The entire proceeding against George, including the jury selection, lasted just one day and the person who was defending George against the accusations was Charles Plowden, a tax commissioner campaigning for election to local office. Plowden, he did not challenge the three officers that arrested George and he did not also challenge all the accusation against him, even though they were the only proof that actually brought George to jail. He didn't even challenge the prosecution presentations of two different versions of George's verbal confession. In one version, it was said that George was attacked by the girls when he was trying to help one of them who had fallen into the ditch so it was self-defense and in the other version it was said that George had followed the girls and then killed them and thrown them into the ditch mind you there was no physical evidence linking the girls murder to George apart from the deputy Newman's statement George's trial had an old white jury which was very common in that period because black people still they had little to no rights and they still were not able to even vote so they could not be selected as jurors. In the day of the trial there were more than a thousand white people but no black people were allowed inside. So other than the testimony of the three police officers there were also called three other testimonies. There were the Reverend Francis Bateson who was the one who found the bodies and the two doctors who had made the post-mortem examinations on the girls. There were made a lot of conflicting confessions and the court also discussed the possibility of sexual assault although the medical examiners had no evidence to support this. George Consul didn't call any witness even if there was remember his sister Amy. They didn't try to defend him and they didn't even try to confirm his alibi that it was with his sister at the time. The trial prosecution lasted two and a half hours and the jury took less than 10 minutes to deliberate coming back and saying that George was found guilty. Judge Philip H. Stoll he sentenced George to death by electrocution. There is no transcript of the trial and no appeal was filed by his defense attorney. George's family, churches and the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, they appealed to the governor, Ollie D. Johnson, for clemency given the young age of the boy, but other people just wanted the head of George. They just wanted him to die by electrocution. So Mr. Olin D. Johnson here, he decided to make these people happy and decided to give no clemency at all. He actually wrote a response and said, it may be interesting for you to know that Steenie killed a smaller girl to abuse the larger one. Then he killed the larger girl and abused her dead body. 20 minutes later, he returned and attempted to abuse her again but her body was too cold. Mind you, there's no proof for this. Not DNA, not physical evidence, anything. Between the time of George's trial and his execution, he was able to see his family only once and he was not able to see them again because there was a very big threat of lynching. This is the part that breaks my heart, that makes me very sad and frustrated. George Stini was executed in the Central Correctional Institution in Colombia on June 16th, 1944 at 7.30 p.m. At 7.25 p.m. he was taken away from his cell by three police officers. He was standing just five feet, one inch tall and weighing just 19 pounds. He was a very small boy. He was brought to the execution room where there was the chair and they used a bible that he used to read all the time as a booster seat because George was so small. George was then restrained by his legs, arm and body to the chair. 
his father George Sr. he was able to approach him and say the last words to his son. He was crying of course and when they asked him if he had some last words he just nodded and continued crying. At this point George was whimpering, taking deep breaths and at the moment they got a strap and put it in his mouth, he started sobbing again and he broke into tears. Then they placed a face mask in his face that did not fit him because it was very, very small. And this was the point when the lethal electricity was applied. Since it was so small, the face mask moved away, revealing his burned scalp and his tears and the saliva dripping from his mouth. He died after eight minutes of agony. He was buried in an unmarked grave in Sumter, South Carolina. His life ended here, but the story doesn't end here. Because in 2004, George Frierson, a local historian who grew up in Alcolu, he decided to investigate more in this case after reading a local newspaper article about it. His work he gained the attention of a lot of people, a lot of attorneys, and between these attorneys there were Steve McKenzie and Matt Burgess. Not only them, but then there was Ray Brown and James Moon, a lot of people who decided to spend a lot of time reading countless hours, trying to find witnesses, trying to find proofs that he was not guilty at all. Amongst those who aided, there were the Civil Rights and Restorative Justice Project, which filed an amicus brief with the court in 2014. If you're wondering what an amicus brief is, Amicus briefs are briefs that are filed in appeals regarding matters of broad public interest, such as civil rights cases or cases that regard education or the powers of law enforcement. So Mackenzie and Burgess, they said, if we can get the case reopened, we can go to the judge and say, there wasn't any reason to convict this child, there was no evidence to present to the jury, there was no transcript, this case needs to be reopened. This is an injustice that needs to be righted. I'm pretty optimistic that if we can get the witnesses, we need to come forward, we will be successful in court. We hopefully have a witness that's going to say that's no family, no relative witness, who is going to be able to tie all this in and say that they were basically an alibi witness. They were there when Mr. Steeny and this did not occur. This was said by Steve McKenzie. George Pearson, in his side, he said, There has been a person that has been named as being the culprit who is now deceased. And it was said by the family that there was a deathbed confession. Frierson said that the culprit actually came from a well-known white family and a member or members of the family had actually participated on the initial coroner's inquest jury, which had recommended that George be prosecuted. Other people that were fighting with the amicus brief said, there is compelling evidence that George Steeny was innocent of the crimes for which he was executed in 1944. The prosecutor relied almost exclusively on one piece of evidence to obtain a conviction in this capital case. The unrecorded, unsigned confession of a 14-year-old who was the pride of counsel and parental guidance and whose defense lawyer shockingly failed to call exculpating witnesses or to preserve his right of appeal. New evidence in the court was brought in 2014 when they brought to testimony George's siblings, remember Amy was with him. She said that at the time of the murder, she actually was with George. In addition, an affidavit was introduced from the reverend who found the girls in the ditch. In this affidavit, it was said that the girls they were not bleeding too much, there was not much blood in there, and this brought attorneys to think that maybe the girls were killed somewhere else, and then later the bodies were brought there. But how can a 14-year-old boy weighing only 19 pounds have the strength to bring these girls from a side of the city to another. Then another witness was brought in. It was Wilford Johnny Hunter, the person that was in prison with George. Wilford said that the boy told him that he was made to confess, that the arresting officers were actually starving him and bribing him with food to confess. And he always, always maintained his innocence. The judge, Carmen Mullen, she decided to vacate George's conviction. She said that he had not received a fair trial, that he was not defended, 
and that his Sixth Amendment right had been violated. She also ruled that George's confession may have been coerced and thus was considered inadmissible. She also found that the execution of a 14-year-old boy was just something to be considered as cruel and a very unusual punishment for just a 14-year-old boy who had only 81 days to be considered guilty. But mind you, she just confined her judgment to the process of the prosecution because she said that George, quote, may have well committed this crime. But when it comes to the legal process, she said, quote, no one can justify a 14-year-old charge, tried, convicted, and executed in some 80 days, concluding that, in essence, not much was done for this child when his life lay in the balance. When it comes to the victim's family, they also were very disappointed on the court's ruling, but they had never doubted that George committed the crime. Binnaker's niece, she also said that she received a phone call in the 90s where the police officer that actually arrested George and said, quote, don't you ever believe that boy didn't kill your aunt, end quote. And they also said that the deathbed confession of the white guy, remember the one that was considered to be the culprit, the claims of this confession were never sustained. So this story, when I was reading about it, you know, I don't really know what happened for sure. What I personally think is that George was innocent. I think it was just easier to make a boy of color pay instead of investigating on a white guy maybe coming from a well-known family and even if he was actually guilty they denied him all of his basic rights imagine this poor boy scared accused of killing someone not able to see his family not able to speak himself not even able to be defended by someone Imagine how scared he was. Imagine how terrible it was for his family. This story happened almost eight years ago. But still today we see how many basic rights are denied. That's why it's so important to keep on fighting, keep on speaking, keep on remembering these people. This has to stop now. This racism, it has been around for way too long. As I said in the beginning, I wanted this story to not be forgotten. I wanted his name to not be forgotten because he's just one of the countless victims of this society. If you're watching this video, I have a message for you. My message is, even though it sounds like a cliche, we're all the same. We have all difficult and different lives. Our skin color doesn't matter. Stop caring about a color. No one chooses his skin color. No one chooses his family. No one chooses his life. Let's be strong and united against all of these bad powers. Let's be strong and united against those who want us to be divided. If you're fighting every day up there, if you're shouting these names and these stories on the streets, my prayers and thoughts go to you. Please be safe out there and please never stop fighting because today you and me, everybody, we are making a change. Today we're making history and it's all up to us what kind of history are we writing. The choices we do today are the basis for tomorrow. Let's make this place a better one. Whoever you are, wherever you are, whatever your skin color is, I love you. All of you. I stand up proud to say that you are all my brothers and my sisters. I hope I will see you in here next time and that it will be better. See you next time guys. Bye.